G. I tend to pronounce it a French way, but how do you pronounce it? Jakes. Okay, Michelle and Jakes. So I have to say that Michelle actually sent me the shortest file in the history of our <laughs> kind of nice in a way. She's worked at, for two decades at the Ontario Art Gallery as a curator of contemporary art. And then she's now chief curator at the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria. And of course there's much more to Michelle than this, but that is the information she presented. I know she's you went to you did your MA in art history at York and has a lot of experience not only curating but also as an educator. So I've had the pleasure of getting to know Michelle a little bit over the time she's here and I I think it's also great everyone's come out so that they can see the face behind the chief curator at our public gallery. And so I'm pleased to welcome you. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Um, thanks to everybody for coming in. And um, the reason that my bio was so short is that um, you asked me to talk about uh, what a curator does and perhaps my path to curating, which ends up being very bi biographical, autobiographical. Um, so you're going to get more detail than <laughs> you probably want. Um, so I uh, from the, the fact that Wendy just gave you that I've worked at the AGO for nearly 20 years, um, you know that I'm old. <laughs> um, and when I was studying and trying to decide what I wanted to do with my life, um, curatorial studies programs didn't exist. So I'm one of those very old school curators that studied art history. I did an undergraduate degree in art history, an MA in art history, and it actually in very traditional art history programs. My undergraduate degree was at Queen's, where, um, you know, as an undergraduate, you don't really have a, a focus or a specialty, but I suppose what I studied the most was um, uh, Renaissance and Baroque painting, and I didn't mean to make that face, I love Renaissance. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I just sort of, uh, physically, without being able to control it, as a contemporary curator, become apologetic, but that's my background, and it comes out in my facial expressions. Um, and then, uh, in my MA, I went to York, which at the time was a program that had to justify its existence in the same city as uh, the University of Toronto's very established art history program by having the students focus on um, 20th century Canadian art. Um, and that should include um, contemporary art, but in the early 90s, uh, we always kind of got stuck in the 1960s. <laughs> so that was my, my training and really what took me to an interest in contemporary art was that when I was at York, I was there for the sort of single two-year period in the history of the art history program when they decided to try and integrate art history in the studio. So um, I took most of my courses with people who were doing their MFAs, and um, I realized that artists were way more interesting than art. And um, decided at that moment that what I wanted to do was work in the contemporary field so that I could work with artists. And um, after my studies, my um, path into curating was actually very long and arduous. And, um, I'm very envious of people who now do curatorial studies programs at great places like UBC and Barnard College and places in Europe because they are able to make networks um, in the field and often don't have to go through the 
long, slow slog through the positions of research assistant, curatorial secretary, curatorial assistant, assistant curator, associate curator, <laughs> acting curator. <laughs> The only thing I've never actually been is a curator, I'm from acting curator to chief curator. Um, so that was that was my my path. I was um, uh, hired at the AGO actually to work in the human resources department after I finished my MA, and um, I swear to God that the reason I got a job as a research assistant in the curatorial department, working with the then chief curator, um, Matthew Teitelbaum, was because he was, he was interviewing people for the position of curator of contemporary art, and there was this like major cock-up in the scheduling, and all of the interviews ended up being scheduled at the same time, and there were three of the most like um, prominent, contemporary curators from across the country all arriving for their interviews thinking that they're going next and I had to sort of manage this um, this conflict and sort of talk people down and, and um, uh, actually no, everybody thought they were going later and that they were going to have time to go through the galleries and come up with ideas for how to um, install the permanent collection. So I had to make somebody go right away, and they didn't have that opportunity to do that, and she didn't get the job. Um, but I think that it was because I kind of was able to manage curators and be very demanding people, not me, but <laughs> that, that um, the chief curator kind of decided to give me a, a foot in the door job. And, um, I worked as a research assistant for a little while and then as a curatorial assistant for five years, which is um, something that probably most curators would be uh, embarrassed to admit that they were somebody's assistant for that long before anybody noticed that um, perhaps there was more to them. Um, and it was frustrating, but I think ultimately um, I have an appreciation for um, the, the work of the curatorial department and how everything fits together and how, um, how the curatorial department works with all of the other departments of the museum and it, it is really that, that period of working as a curatorial assistant and having the opportunity to work with um, a very active curator on some very exciting projects. At the time I was working with Jessica Bradley. Um, who's now a, a dealer in Toronto, um, but at the time she was doing um, really incredible projects with um, Cindy Sherman and Rachel Whitey and Laura Salcedo and all of these people that I would never have had the opportunity to work with if I had, um, you know, sort of skipped that step of being a curatorial assistant to somebody at that point in, in her career. Um, she did, though, during that five-year period, um, find some opportunities to sort of test my mettle. And the first project that I, I did, um, where I got to choose the content, was this project um, working with a local artist, Sally Mackay. So the, uh, there was a project room, um, which is actually even a little bit smaller than this room that we're sitting in now, at the Art Gallery of Ontario, where we did a series called the Present Tense, and I think in the end we did probably 40 iterations of projects in this, in this series before the um, the renovation project finally happened and, and it started to, we had to shut down and then we direct our programming. So um, up until this point, other colleagues, Jessica Bradley and the, the assistant curator in the department, um, Christina Ritchie, had been doing um, exhibitions in the 
this space, and then given the opportunity to do something, I, I um, realized that I, I kind of wanted to be true to the, um, the aspect of the local arts community that I was really engaged in in Toronto as a kind of young person trying to um, initiate a career. And I had become uh, really connected to a space called Art Metropole, which is um, an organization, it's an artist-run organization that was founded by A.A. A. Bronson, who was a member of General Idea. And it's a bookstore and they sell artist multiples and other kinds of ephemeral projects. And at this point, which was 1998, um, there was a lot of activity in Toronto that um, tried to address the fact that there weren't that many opportunities for local artists to show in mainstream institutions. So artists were um, really into a, a do-it-yourself aesthetic and do-it-yourself strategies. Um, they would make things that were very affordable and accessible so that they could kind of permeate um, the community in a, in a way that was different from um, other uh, more traditional art formats and they would rent spaces at the time. There was so much kind of empty warehouse and office space in Toronto that there were all these kinds of exhibitions and projects that were happening that were completely um, artist initiated. And Sally Mackay was an artist who was involved both in producing um, this kind of accessible level of, of art. Sold a lot of stuff through Art Metropole and she was um, connected to a lot of collectives that were doing um, self-initiated projects. So we decided, I mean, that now that I look back at, at this project, in one way it, it's obvious that it set the course for a lot of the things that I did. In another way, at the time, it seemed so radical to like, say, can you paint the walls green? <laughs> and um, to like put old scruffy um, Ernie and Bert dolls <laughs> in the galleries and call them sculptures. Um, now it's not not so radical at all. But um, the other interesting thing about the way Sally approached this project is that she was really kind of um, playing with the idea of herself as a collector and. Um, presenting these things that she had so laboriously collected from Valley Villages and other thrift shops over the years in the context of uh, the, um, the AGO, which was the place that celebrated real collectors. So it was pretty tongue-in-cheek and we did some other things, um, like that big freak sign, please take one. Those were um, little uh, artist's flyers that she produced that she usually sold at Art Metropole. So we um, made the AGO buy them up front so that we could give them to the audience. And um, I don't have an image of the wall, but on the opposite wall, there were even more substantial artist's multiples that were on hooks in the gallery. And there was just a donation box and people were invited to purchase them. Um, in the end, when we did the math of the amount of money received and the amount, the number of um, multiples given away, you know, people were paying the equivalent of 25 cents per per item. Most most things were just taken, but um, that was fine. It was about about uh, talking about uh, the accessibility of art in the context of an institution which didn't usually talk about accessibility. Now the AGO is all about accessibility. Most public institutions are, but um, more than 15 years ago it was a little bit of a new conversation. So um, now I'm going to skip ahead. In the, in the interim years, there's seven years there, um, and there really is working at a place like the Art Gallery of Ontario, or even at the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria, in my current role, a 
large aspect of what a curator does is um, organizing incoming traveling shows or working with guest curators. So over the course of this seven year period that I'm not talking about, I continue to do projects in that project room. Um, I organized a lot of uh, traveling shows, including um, a great show with Yoko Ono. So I know a lot of curators who don't like that aspect of the job, like having to be the, the lackey who organizes somebody else's work. But I always, um, even if it's not somebody as famous as, as Yoko Ono, I always find um, something um, but there's something to be learned from the experience of working on somebody else's exhibition. And um, I'm going to totally talk about something that probably should be confidential. But, um, you know, I was recently um, speaking to a young curator uh, in the context of um, an interview, and I asked how, what steps she would take um, in order to work with, in order to engage in a project with a guest curator. And it was just like such a clear and well thought through answer that I thought, my God, I hope that I remember that when I'm next in an interview because yeah. she said that um, she would read as much as she could about the content of the exhibition and then she would sit down and speak to the guest curator about their motivations for doing that exhibition so that she could um, understand the, the guest curator's relationship to the content from their perspective. And um, I think like it's such a, such a subtle thing, but um, you know, I, had all, I have my, my uh, timelines and my checklists, and I, I always thought that the way you approached that was just to know what all of the steps were and to undertake them um, with enthusiasm. But it really is about engaging with, with um, the guest curator and the content of the guest curator show in that kind of way where you're trying to understand somebody's, somebody's motivation for wanting to share the ideas with an audience. Um, so what I am jumping ahead to is a moment um, that we're about to enter here in Victoria. 2005 was just after the groundbreaking at the Art Gallery of Ontario. So in 2004, um, uh, a big renovation project was announced. Frank Gehry was the architect. It was called Transformation AGO because um, the institution wanted to communicate that it wasn't just um, the building that was changing, but that the whole institution was going to transform itself. And so out of that idea, out of that motivation, um, we entered into a series of projects. And overall, the series was called Swing Space. And in, uh, within the context of an architectural renovation, a swing space is a space that isn't being affected by the construction, by the build, that um, has to be shared between multiple functions. So what happened at the AGO was there were a couple of galleries that were um, older galleries that weren't being renovated at all. And during the build, they served special event, event spaces, as public programming spaces, as well as gallery spaces. Um, so swing space referred to the fact that we weren't able to do traditional programming um, in those galleries during this period of, of the build. And um, we uh, came up with a number of kind of structuring devices to think about the kinds of exhibitions that we would present in this context, and we're looking at a, a installation shot of a piece of, or an installation by Louis Jacob called Habitat, and this was part of um, a series of projects which we called Open Space, 
which referred to the fact that um, the audience was going to be invited into the space of presentation to kind of really engage with, um, with the work and the conversation that the artist was trying to present. So this is an extremely kind of complicated um, proposition that Louis is making here. Um, the uh, movie playing on one of the monitors is Harold and Maude, which is a movie about a very kind of um, untraditional relationship between a young man and a, a much older woman, but they're both creative spirit, spirits and are kind of uh, drawn to each other. They're, um, there's all of those meditation pillows. That space was actually used for a meditation class. The ch circle of chairs that was used for a reading group it was also, um, it could be booked by um, local organizations for, for meetings. So uh, it was an installation that forced the Art Gallery of Ontario to accept the artist's proposition that his installation should be um, should be used by the public. He didn't want us to tell people not to touch anything or not to sit on things. It, um, it was meant to be used. DJs would come in on Saturdays and there would be dance parties and the guards were all trained to just let this happen. <laughs> This project actually ended up being um, seen by the curators of the 2007 Documenta, and Louis was invited to be in that project, and um, has ended up having a pretty, um, pretty active career in Europe ever since that involvement in Documenta. So this is just a, a different angle. And there's, there's Louis. Um, he's at, this is an event of um, the AGO's highest end donors. <laughs> They're all people who have given at least $20,000 a year to the institution. And normally when they come in for artists' talks, they sit in very fancy chairs. And um, uh, the artist is behind a podium and is very inaccessible. And, um, this is exactly the kind of thing that we really hoped would happen in this space, that it would be completely, um, it would completely break down the expectations of the institution and people would just start to behave differently. Is he standing? Is it? And that's Louis standing up. And that's, uh, I can't remember that guy's name, William something. He was the chair of the Curator Circle Committee, which was the the group of high-end donors. Um, another series that we uh, kind of played around with during um, during the renovation project was um, a series of installations that we called um, Media Art Space. And um, it, they focused on um, works of art that used technology to force the viewer into a kind of different experience within the, um, the space of the gallery. So this is a piece called Lumen by Jennifer Steinkamp, who is a California media artist. And um, it just looks like wavy lines in, in this image. It's actually two intersecting projections of um, moving lines so that, uh, and the projectors are on the floor so that the view becomes incorporated into the installation. And this was just a candid shot of, of the way people would typically interact with this, um, with this piece. And um, uh, again, you know, it's hard to believe that 10, 10 years ago, um, um, not a lot of people felt empowered enough to go into the museum and demand the kind of experience that they wanted. Like a lot of people stayed away from the museum because they thought it was supposed to be a very reverent relationship. So having this opportunity when the space, like the gallery, looked really crappy because half of the 
spaces had big plywood awnings up in that, and we shifted the hours so we were open late every night and because the gallery space was so reduced. Um, I think admission was even waived, so the audience was completely different and um, really came looking for a social experience. And I think that um, that is becoming more and more of an expectation now. Um, and uh, it's the challenge to museums to figure out how to how to respond to to the fact. You know, a lot of people talk about social media and have this um, perception that it's created a a disconnected society where people sit in their basements, never speaking to each other face to face. And I think it's just the opposite. I think it's broken down barriers and. So this is um, the space that kind of best illustrates the idea of the swing space. This was a room that would be used for high-end dinners um, and for uh, lectures, which at the AGO could attract 200 or 250 people. So the floor of the gallery had to be kept clear. So we decided that we would do a series called um, Wall Works. And um, so these were obviously works that um, uh, existed just on the walls. And I think that when my now boss, David Mose, um, curator of contemporary art, came up with the idea, he, he was um, primarily a painting specialist. So he had this image in his head of all of these people who painted on walls. And I had um, uh, seen a project in Halifax similar premise where the St. Mary's University Art Gallery divided the space into 15 sections and asked 15 artists to come and paint something on the wall. And Christine Swintak um, uh, moved the entire contents of her bedroom into the gallery and mailed it to the wall. <laughs> so I thought, let's invite her to do something in this wall works series. And, um, uh, she came up with this crazy idea where she um, went through the the, um, the bins in the back of the gallery because the other part of the renovation was the big clean up and they were getting rid of like 40 years worth of garbage. So she found all of this crap, like those are the old security videotapes. The jeans are actually from um, the Buy the Pound clothing store in Toronto was closing down, so it was normally a dollar a pound, and I think they were having a sale where they were closed for 25 cents a pound, so she just kept coming back with bags and bags of old clothes, and uh, she set herself up in there for a while. She would speak to the public, get their ideas about what she should be doing, and uh, put up some scaffolding. So it was kind of merging the old idea of the bedroom, but the other thing she was really interested in is this architectural style. She had just moved to Toronto, and there's an architectural style that's very popular in um, Toronto, early 20th century buildings. It's the Beaux-Arts style. And so a lot of the buildings um, from the early 20th century have these elaborate sort of um, structures around the doorways. So she constructed one of those <laughs> out, of, out of all of this junk. And somewhere along the way, um, decided that it would be um, this kind of game where she'd create what appeared to be a perfect mirror image on either side of the door with the, the um, deer's head as the central image. <laughs> um, but the piece was called The Thing That Won't Let You Walk Away because there was one element which wasn't mirrored. And um, it seems like such a crazy thing to invite people to do, to spend all of this time looking at this crazy 
instruction to figure out what she has in here, but they would do it. <laughs> people totally loved it. And I think it was because, you know, it was obvious that the work came from the mind of somebody who was pretty wacky, and um, people like to engage with a wacky mind. <laughs> Um, so, at the time that we were working on the renovation, I was invited to curate a zone in um, the second iteration of Nuit Blanche. And Nuit Blanche is um, uh, an event, I'm sure most of you know, but it's an event that happens in many cities around the world. In Toronto, it's been happening in Toronto every fall since 2006. So 2007 was um, its second iteration, and um, even though it was a crazy thing to undertake this while working at the HEO and working on the Reno project, um, it was just too um, interesting an opportunity to refuse. Um, it was still in the earliest years of Nuit Blanche, so there was um, there was even there was more freedom than there is now. Uh, zone B refers to the fact that I was given the neighborhood around the AGO to work with, and the title that I gave um, uh, the zone that year at the corner of Time and Place referred to the fact that that neighborhood, which is basically now Chinatown, over its history has been home to many different. Um, cultural groups. So, of course, it was originally Aboriginal land, and then it um, it was the neighborhood that the wealthy um, British families moved into, so um, the Art Gallery of Ontario's first home, and it's the building is still there at the back of uh, the museum, uh, is a old brick house called the Grange, so much like the HEGB here, beginning in the Spencer House, the AGO began in the Grange House. And um, much like here, that house was donated by a woman who recognized that the city was in the art gallery. And um, so then after the wealthy British people started to move north into Rosedale and Forest Hill, um, it slowly became the destination for for other other cultural groups. There um, is the oldest uh, Baptist church, or actually African Canadian Baptist church, in the province of Ontario in that neighborhood. Um, there are remnants of the fact that it used to be um, the destination for Jewish people moving from Eastern Europe, um, and Probably most recently, uh, it became Chinatown when the city of Toronto physically moved Chinatown, which existed previously on the site that is now um, New City Hall, to this location. So it's not always a kind of happy history, um, uh, but all of these traces of these cultural groups are still are still there. So that's what I decided to explore. And um, uh, I invited 10 artists to respond to this thesis. Adad Hanna, at the time he was based in Montreal, and now he's, um, he's based in Vancouver. And um, he had become Kind of recognized for doing these videos where he would film um, people trying to hold a tableau. So he um, did his project in a, in a location called the Rex Hotel, which is an old jazz hotel, jazz venue. And um, he created, uh, in the weeks leading up to the event, all of these um, videos that try to capture the, the essence of that, that history of jazz in the, in the neighborhood. I should have thought to bring you some, 
some video because it is quite remarkable to watch them because people are able to hold the, the pose for a while and it looks like you're looking at a photograph and then all of a sudden people start to waver. It just becomes too much and it's uh, really um, uh, kind of disconcerting when you first realize that you're looking at, at a moving image. Michelle, would you mind just explaining Tableau in case some people oh, don't sure. know about it? So in, in these um, two images that you can see here, uh, actually what, what Ada did was he approached it as though he really was on a film set. He moved into the, the bar. They had to shut down for a day. And he set up um, these scenarios at different tables with different actors and um, sort of gave them their their backstory and their motivation and um, you know said okay so you're you're sort of leaning in and talking to each other if you look at the, the screen on the on the left there but you're looking off at somebody else and hold it so they would hold it as long as they could um, often for quite some time like some of these videos are 10 or 12 12 minutes. And um, so <coughs> the scenarios, they, they appear to be uh, still they appear, they appear to be still photographs. And then the night of the event, um, he reinstalled all of the props from the shoot. Um, but of course, the people weren't at the tables and the, the televisions were set up um, around the bar. And I think that the, the reason the um, bar owners were willing to shut down for that day of the shoot was because they were very excited about the notion of having all of the Nuit Blanche revelers in the bar all night um, <laughs> when the event finally came. But in the first year of Nuit Blanche, I think um, about 500,000 people attended. Mm -hmm. And in the second year, I think it was about a million. So I'm not sure that the bar owner was quite so happy about the chaos that happened mm -hmm. in the bar as he, as he thought he would be. Um, but I'm sure he made a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And um, I worked with Spintac again in New York Launch, and she did this crazy piece which. Uh, I'm not sure, I think the reason it became called Thunder Egg Alley was because she put that title on it early on when it was supposed to be a very different project. And ultimately it got a um, subtitle which was called The Dumpster Diver's Paradise. And she turned this um, City of Toronto dumpster into a free hotel. <laughs> <laughs> and um, somehow convinced 30 of her closest friends to help her staff this hotel for 12 hours on the night of Louis Blanche. So there was the concierge and um, <laughs> there are some guests because you would have to book 15 minute periods in the, in the, um, in the dumpster hotel and they like lock you in and you could do whatever you wanted in there. There's the swim tech, the, um, the host of the hotel. The folks in the safety vests are the um, are the chambermaids. But they're actually dressed as garbage men because it's a dumpster. <laughs> it's an indication of, of how um, Nuit Blanche sort of um, changes people's positions to art. Apparently, my then boss, David Mills, curator of contemporary art, was visiting this piece and he saw the chambermaids go in in their hard hats and their safety vests and he said to somebody standing or probably just to nobody, he just said, why do they dress like garbage men? And you know, the woman standing beside him was probably just Jane Public. He looked at him and said, well, because it's a dumpster. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 
I'm not sure why he didn't get that, but it was very nice that it was so obvious to her. <laughs> that was certainly the goal. And I'm not sure if any of you have been to Newby Lunch, but it did sort of get to the point where it was so much work and so out of control that now the city has very sort of specific relationships with certain venues, so they use a lot of um, bank plazas and lobbies and uh, spaces around City Hall. But the year that um, I worked on it, uh, each, each artist was allowed to say, I want to this venue. So Swintac, we had to negotiate for a dumpster and she got access to um, the know what you call it. Down on Eastern Avenue, there's a place where all of the garbage goes. And um, uh, she had like 24 hour access to it so she could clean up her dumpster and turn it into a hotel before the event. And um, another artist that I worked with, Millie Chen, um, I didn't even realize this when, when I invited Millie. But she had done work about Chinatown before, so that was my interest in her. But when I invited her to participate, she said, oh, did you know that when my family moved here from Taiwan in the 60s, we lived in that neighborhood in four different houses. So they kept having to move because they were living in sort of rather precarious situations. But we went door to door um, with her mother, because Wendy doesn't speak um, Um, asking if we could use the homes that Millie had lived in as the sites for her work. So she did this piece called Watcher, and um, was very generous of these folks to allow her to do this piece because they're all um, rear projections in the windows of the houses. She created this narrative. Um, it's a video that is sort of uh, told through the language of um, uh, shadow, as a shadow play. It's a bit more obvious there. But it was really um, amazing because, um, well, A, because we were allowed to do this, that we got permission from, from private citizens to use their homes in this way. But um, it was a pretty simple, um, language that was very effective on the night and people would be standing out on the street trying to figure out what was going on and they thought that they were just lines pulled down and that there were people performing a play in the back of the blinds and um, uh, because the narratives were rather long people had to stay for a long time to realize that they would finally loop around. And Millie's work um, is very appealing to me because it is very much about her um, position as an Asian immigrant, but always kind of presented in this universal language so that um, uh, the narratives are not specific. They're very um, accessible and very relatable from different kinds, by different kinds of audiences. But um, I like to throw this next project in, this next Jimmy Blanche project in, just to um, uh, talk about how far a curator should or shouldn't go in terms of supporting an artist's project. So Mackenzie Key is an American artist whose work I had seen um, sometime before this Event. And what I had seen were these like very beautiful um, installations in the landscape where she would take like, lots of ping pong balls and put them in a field. So uh, part of the neighborhood where I was working is included University Avenue, which is like a big boulevard in Toronto with um, uh, what do you call it? It's got a strip of green space down the middle of it. So I just imagined that she would do something on that green space with, with um, 
of ping pong balls, and that would be the end of it. But she was she had moved beyond ping pong balls, and I don't want to force an artist to take to move backwards. She wanted to move forward. That was fine. But then she kept proposing things that we couldn't um, realize. She wanted to do a project where we would go to a public swimming pool and she would stretch fabric over the surface of the water, like just with this much space between the surface of the water and the fabric. And people would be allowed to go into the pool and swim <laughs> with fabric. And like the guy who runs the pool is like, are you crazy? <laughs> Then she wanted to do something in an alley behind Spadina Avenue, which would have required that we knock on approximately um, the doors of approximately 30 businesses and get permission from 30 different people. And we went to the first business and they said no. And we gave up. <laughs> and, um, so then the next thing that she proposed was that she would move the contents of a house from uh, private space to public space and that the public would do this move and that she would provide drawings that would allow them to completely recreate the layout and the contents of the apartment out on the street and it would stay there all night and um, people would be able to engage with all of the contents of this apartment out in public for 12 hours. <laughs> A million people. <laughs> and we did that with my stuff. Oh. <laughs> so this is inside the apartment with everything numbered because once it was brought outside, <laughs> People would have to follow these drawings to figure out where to put things. And this is people moving stuff out of the house. And people really got into this. Like, I can never find people to help me. <laughs> <laughs> people stood on the front steps saying, hey, will you help us bring this stuff four blocks that way? They were like, sure. No this is me looking very nervous, <laughs> <laughs> carrying my stuff. This is uh, the contents growing outside. Like, she didn't even let me clean up. There are my slippers inside <laughs> the bed. All the crap that was on the bed. This so did so they put it down exactly the way it was? I mean, on the street was it exactly the same? It was. It was more or less the same. Like there was, uh, so that wooden structure there. Uh, we had to get a carpenter to build some um, walls and uh, like the equivalent of closets and stuff. Mm -hmm. But it was. It was pretty close. My one. Um, uh, kind of memento from this Mimi Blanche experience are the notes. Like, people found this memo block on my desk. Um, and, you know, it was in a container. And it wasn't until a few weeks later that I opened it up and people had been leaving <laughs> notes inside it. <laughs> like, and really beautiful things. Like, um, uh, generous of you to share this with us, or um, the, your letters are so touching, especially the one from Thierry that was <laughs> 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 Thierry was some guy that I met in France when I was 17. <laughs> I, don't, I didn't even know I kept that letter, but they found it. The best, the best part of, of the evening was um, the artist was standing around and she heard this woman saying, um, oh my god, I can't believe that Michelle let her do this. Michelle is such a private person. I've never even been to her apartment. <laughs> and so then Mackenzie turned around and said, oh, do you know her? It was my mother. <laughs> Yes, 
say, as long as I said yes, it could happen. I mean, it just hit so many goals. But, um, and there it is, closer to the end of the night. The artist had a three-month-old baby, so at a certain point she said, I'm out of here. And then I was left with all of my stuff in the street, and then I had to call my mother and father and come and help me pack it up. I know! <laughs>
her that had exposed her child to something that they shouldn't know about. But um, I really uh, sort of liked this idea of the juxtaposition of the contemporary and um, and the historical and uh, perhaps more respectful or at least accepted juxtaposition was this project that Sherry Boyle did called Flesh and Blood. And this, um, this project um, came about because uh, the, the major renovation was already done, but then there was a sort of smaller reno to the um, studio happening, the education center. And at a certain point, we realized, wait a minute, we're installing Sherry Boyle's very delicate um, ceramics just above the spot where they're renovating the studio and like, drilling into cement floors, and that's not going to work. So, shockingly, it was the curator of European art who said, why don't you put her show in the European galleries? And you can just see uh, in the background there of this portrait of Sherry, images of um, works from a European collection. Because she, um, you know, much of her work refers to mythology and animism, and um, it depicts, um, you know, this is sort of like a, a mashup of a young, or a youth, you can't tell what sex they are playing a guitar, but it also kind of refers to the idea of, of Cupid or um, one of those youthful uh, classical gods. And then um, she also was doing things like this, the figure carrying two um, animal figures. So she went through the European collection and, and chose historical works from the 16th and 17th centuries that she felt uh, um, made sense with, with her work. Um, and this was a much more well-received <laughs> of the contemporary and the historical. I came across this unexpectedly mm -hmm. when I was up in 2010, and it was just delightful. It was just such a surprise. Yeah. You just don't expect it, and it worked so well. Yeah, yeah it was amazing, some of the relationships that she was able to yeah, find. And it actually structure. made the paintings on the wall seem more alive. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I didn't know you did that. that was yeah. awesome. And then um, a more successful intervention in the Henry Moore Center was to work with Brian Duncan. Um, so in the foreground, you've got uh, one of Brian's sculptures, which is a, a hide, a deer hide stretched over the um, frame of a car door and um, presented on top of a uh, chest freezer. <laughs> it doesn't really seem like it has much to do with, with Henry Moore. And Brian had already made this work. It's work that's very different from, like, in the past he'd been working with um, Nike shoes and golf bags, and there's a much more pop aesthetic to his work. And uh, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn. I think he has said this himself that he turned 40 and he um, started to spend more time in the interior of BC, up north, back where he grew up with his mother's family, and started hunting and started kind of really looking at. Um, the way um, Aboriginal people were living up there. You know, that everybody had a chest freezer on the porch and um, carcasses of cars all over the place. And he really is kind of responding to that experience. And when he put everything together, he felt that it took on this kind of, um, a certain kind of modernist aesthetic. One that was more about um, a British kind of modernism that didn't um, kind of let go of the references to the body as much as American modernism might have. Um, so he said he wanted to install his work in the Henry Moore Center, and I said, "Okay, I'm gonna try and make that happen for you, but can you tell?"
tell me what your argument is because people are going to ask why. And he said, I don't know, it's just a feeling. You figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> so I wish I still had a copy of the letter because I actually had to write a letter to the Henry Moore Foundation to rationalize this and they went for it and this was um, like an extremely well received exhibition and um, uh, yeah. Um, well, it really makes sense because there is a kind of awkwardness to the place that anyone's mm -hmm. work is on. Mm -hmm. They just seem like it's not right. And then Brian Union is really drawing attention to the awkwardness of the place yeah. by using a freezer. Yeah. And there's, you know, uh, I'm not sure if it's really clear here, but Henry Moore's forms, even though they're figurative, there are often these weird corners to them. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes all the artist has is a sense, but of course it's, it, there's something meaningful at the root of it, and if you pursue it, um, the effect, the results can be pretty interesting. So, um, I'm going to conclude just with a few images of things that I've been working on at the, at the AGGV, and, um, uh, one of my former co-workers at the AGO, Lloyd DeWitt, is um, he's a Rembrandt scholar. Like, I worked for years with a Rembrandt scholar, and then I come here and I throw things together. Like, winter is an etching, the printmaking legacy of Rembrandt and Lynn, as if I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but what happened was, um, I think it was the Richard, no, the Burnaby Art Gallery borrowed all of, they asked if they could borrow all of the Dutch prints from our collection. And we said, fine, make a little bit of money when we lend work to another gallery. And then they gave it the title, the subtitle, Dutch Masterpieces from the Collection of the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria. So everybody was calling us to find out when the show was coming here, because it seems though it was a show that we were circulating. And um, it wasn't interesting enough to me just to represent what they had presented. So I started to think about what, what it could be translated into when the work came back. And um, kind of the range of Dutch work um, didn't fully make sense to me, because some of it was very academic classical, and some of it was from, well, there were the Rembrandts, and then there was work from the school of Rembrandt, and um, people a little bit younger than him, and that work was very exciting. So what I wanted to look at was um, the impact of Rembrandt's um, printmaking on subsequent generations. So the installation includes work by Katha Kohlwitz, a German artist who worked in the 20th century early 20th century interwar period. Um, and George Wallace, uh, who is an artist who lived in Ontario, or taught in Ontario for most of his career, and then um, retired to Victoria. So there's a kind of nice holding of his work in the um, collection of the gallery. And um, you know, it's not a bad little show. And the really funny thing is this title, Winter is an Etching, um, I just, I started Googling etching to see what kind of phrases would come up. Sometimes that's how I title things. And I came across this poem which is called Winter is an Etching, Spring a Watercolor, Oil, no, Summer an Oil Painting, and Autumn a Combination of Them All, or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it's by this poet, New York City-based poet named Stanley Horowitz. And he's not a very famous poet. And um, like I couldn't find any books of his poetry. This 18-word poem was published in the Reader's Digest in 1983, I think. Um, and so, 
what I kind of explore in the installation is the idea that um, an artist could become very famous through printmaking because prints can be spread widely um, in the same way that this poet could become very famous because his words could be spread through the internet. So even though um, the work in the show is not terribly contemporary, George Wallace is probably the most recent work, um, I think that it has that, we're looking at etching through that contemporary lens, or printmaking through that contemporary lens, and comparing it, or drawing equivalents to, to the internet. The most remarkable thing is that Stanley Horowitz is still alive and somehow found out about the show and has been emailing me mm -hmm. and um, he doesn't ever travel so he's terribly sorry that he won't be able to come here to see the show but maybe I could send him pictures of it. Actually what he first suggested was that maybe the show would travel to New York. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh you're so cute. <laughs> copies of all of the communications that he had with Reader's Digest, like the first letter saying, thank you, Mr. Horowitz, for submitting more of your poems. <laughs> it's very unlikely that they're going to be published. <laughs> and then like four years later, a letter saying, we published one of them. Here's your check for $50. <laughs> and now, if you um, do a Google search on Winter as an etching, probably get close to a million hits. It's, um, it's a very popular little piece of text. So working from that kind of strategy, the next thing that I'm working on, um, this is just a hint of it, is something called Girls, Historical Portraits from the Collection of the AGGB. And I'm being like um, a complete uh, opportunist and um, am calling it girls so that we can benefit from the popularity and controversy of Lena Dunham's hit HBO show, Girls. Um, but I also found, um, what should I do before Google, I also found a quote, a Margaret Atwood quote, which goes something like, um, little girls are only little and cute to adults. Um, to them, they are life-sized. And um, like there's something in that show and the often negative reactions to it, and in that quote, which is from Cat's Eye, which is about an artist from the missing of you know, her childhood and her fight kind of complicated relationships with her young female friends about, um, you know, how we look at young women as um, not fully sentient beings, but of course they are, and to themselves, they are, the, you know, they are the most important things. And, um, how uh, how can we explore through art if we can do it through a television show and uh, work of fiction? Can we do it through a visual art project to explore this um, obviously very timely conversation and bring that bring that debate into the art department? So that's my last slide. And um, 
participation into the exhibits and whatnot. I'm wondering if you're going to be pulling people out of their houses in Victoria and bringing them into the gallery to engage with uh, contemporary work. Well, it's, you know, it's interesting because um, I have been thinking a lot about the fact that um, for a long time the AGTV has had two educators, one who is public programs and one who does schools and tours. And um, I've noticed that whenever I see an education position posted now, it's usually called audience engagement or community engagement. And um, I think that the AGGD actually has a ton of work to do. Um, I'm starting to think that whenever we do an artist's talk at the AGGD, we should just advertise that I'm going to be talking first. And then <laughs> Our past two artists talks, we've had like eight or twelve people. I'm just, I'm being, I'm being facetious. Um, but I do think that there is a, like there's a, the gallery has been a little bit schizophrenic. It hasn't built a cohesive audience. So, there's a lot of audience for certain things, and really it's kind of the, the things that we've been doing since 1960 that people expect of us, and we haven't really done the work to be accepted as a place where more unconventional things happen. For some reason it works with Urbanite, but not with other things. Booze. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so things will be much easier in the new building when we can have a like a overarching liquor license because right now we have to work, we have to apply for a license for every event that has booze. So um, is the urbanite? Do you, would you say the urbanite is an opportunity for people to engage with art? Increasingly, it is. Um, you know, like at the, was that the last one that was structured around urban Thunderbirds? I think so. And at one point, Randy, one of the artists in the show, was giving a talk and there must have been 120 people in the gallery listening to him. So people do yeah. want that and we just have to be more creative about how we give them little um, opportunities to engage with the art go back for a drink, come back for another <laughs> kind of art. Um, so I think that um, we are starting to be more thoughtful about that, be more strategic about it, to take it seriously, to take audience engagement and community engagement seriously as something that we have to work at um, instead of just like how we we do something and not enough people come. Yeah. Is there anything that we can do as an artist community to help that process? Come to events. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. There's that. But I, I think that as we um, enter into the um, the renovation process. Um, the first thing that we should be doing is is all talking about what we want the gallery to be and how um, how how it can be a more important part of the community, how it can be a better resource. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I know, I know this sounds really facetious, but I, I really I love the art gallery, but there's no cafe, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's so far away from everything else. And there's no cafe in the neighbourhood either until you go either to Fernwood or down to Cook Street. So I'm yeah. really hoping there's going to be some kind of cafe or restaurant because then it would, it means that mm. after you've walked around or done whatever, you, you can sit there and have a cup of tea. No, absolutely. Mm -hmm. like, um, uh, it's, it's interesting. I, I was in Tokyo last week, and Tokyo is a huge city, and it's absolutely full of these little galleries that are in out-of-the-way neighborhoods. And people make the trek.
tracks to those galleries. Um, there's always a cafe. Mm -hmm. um, it does, in that neighborhood, if there was a cafe that was accessible even when the gallery wasn't open, then it would become the neighborhood cafe. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a real rationale for it. Um, when I always joke at the gallery, because when, when I was working at the AGO, I worked around the clock. The gallery never closed. There was security there all night. You could literally work for 24 hours, and nobody would question it. Here, I get kicked out of the office at 10 after 5, and everything <laughs> gets locked up. And why would you want to work late anyway? Mm -hmm. um, and I always like joke with my colleagues and say that I didn't mind working late in Toronto because you'd work until 7 or 8 o'clock and then you'd stick your head out of your office door to see who else was around and then you'd say, hey, let's go for a cocktail <laughs> and you didn't even have to leave the building because there were bars in the building and um, uh, two of my favorite co-workers at the AGO, my two favorite colleagues were the bartender and the pastry chef. <laughs> Thank you.